Chris has been in EA for almost 20 years and focuses on standards in internal tools and methods. He sits on the Open Group Governing Board and is a member of the TOGAF Standard Standing Committee. Welcome, Please. sir. Thank you, you very much. Right there. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how standards provide business value value to businesses like Fujitsu, where I'm from, but also hopefully like businesses to the ones you represent here today. Now this presentation comes out of some work I've done internally with Fujitsu to really look at how we get value out of standards and how we can maximize that value. And as we go through this, I hope there'll be some things in this that can help your organizations do the same thing as well. So let's move on. So I'm going to start off with, uh, I guess, a bit of a confession. I think standards are a good thing. I guess I wouldn't be standing up here if I didn't. Hopefully you'll all recognize that fairly standard piece of user interface equipment there. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because, because of that standard, it means that pretty much any competent driver can get into any modern car. You can drive it around reasonably. OK, you might not be able to work the sat-nav too well or Bluetooth sync your phone, but you'll be able to drive it. You'll be able to get it to where you need it to go. And you didn't need to be trained about how to drive that particular car because of the standard of that control. Is another example. Hopefully, again, most of you will recognize that piece of equipment. Um, the previous speaker, in fact, talked a lot about this particular application. Standards give you that interoperability. Uh, RJ45 lead, let's be honest, you don't even really think about it nowadays, do you? Just plug it into your laptop, your server, whatever it is, and it just works. And it works because of all of those physical standards, the electrical standards, all of the other standards around how those things operate. It just works. So standards give us the interoperability. And then finally, standards allow us to optimize our processes. A great example, a car production line there. It's because of the, the repeatability of the standard processes. It allows us to really optimize the, the, the tooling, the, the process flow, the logistics, everything about that process. So we get, um, we get the uh, increased quality, we get the increased speed, and we get the reduced cost, cost, all of those good things that we want. And we kind of, we're all, we're all playing at this, we're all playing at this. Uh, I've got on this chart just a selection of some of the major standards bodies, including, of course, the Open Group, and uh, Fujitsu ourselves up there, along with some of the other IT service providers and some of the other uh, major tech suppliers. And my point from this chart is not really to look at, well, who, who's a member of what, but just if you look at that, you can see there's a fairly broad spread of little ticks across the chart. So there's a pretty consistent pattern here of uh, the major uh, tech suppliers and IT service providers involved in these standards bodies. So th there's clearly something here, isn't it? And uh, actually good to see on this chart, Steve, there's probably uh, maybe more ticks on the open group line than a lot of the other organizations. So hey, must be doing something good. So what's the value? I've, I've talked about some of these things already. Uh, we've talked about the, uh, the uh, accelerator pedal, or I guess I should say here, the gas pedal and the brake. And what that gives for us is workforce flexibility, because it means that uh, we define standards uh, with their best practice methods, inputs and outputs, and that means that we can, we can fairly freely distribute tasks, pieces of work around a workforce because everybody's been trained and is familiar with that same approach. So, great way of getting value out of the standards. Interoperability, again, previous speakers spoke a lot of this. Uh, the standard interfaces means we can flexibly distribute processing and information around what services or hosts we're using. 
and it also has an effect to commoditize the services, which again is, is good for, for cost and quality and efficiency. And then finally, process optimization, because again, standards give us those best practice, repeatable processes. It means we can optimize, optimize time, quality, cost of the flow of components and, and the tooling that we use in our production processes to really get the best end result. Some examples of these things just taken from the open group portfolio, workforce flexibility. Uh, you maybe use TOGAF in your enterprise architecture practice, so again, you can flexibly assign architects to architecture assignments because everybody's familiar with that way of working. Um, interoperability, example I've taken here, again, previous speaker spoke about this, but uh, OPAS is aimed at doing this sort of thing in the process industry, defining those standard interfaces. And in process optimization, IT for IT gives us a standard model to follow, which means, again, we can really drive the efficiencies in that process, the best practice approach, and get the best services uh, at best speed, best quality, lowest cost. However, we can do more than this. So I said I would give you th three ways to get value from standards and standards bodies. And that last part's important because it's not just about the standards, it's the standards bodies as well. So the standards bodies, of course, give us access to the latest industry standards, the techniques and the know-how, et cetera. But the standards bodies also give us publication and presentation platforms that we might not, or, uh, we might not otherwise have access to. And it gives us networking opportunities as well. Uh, and these things shouldn't be ignored. These things give us real value. So how do we get value from these things? Well. Fairly obviously, in the first example of uh, the access to the latest standards, we can use our intellectual property in our internal processes, our internal tools and methods, and that's great. And there's also actually a, a, a side effect here. Um, one of the other things uh, I, I do within Fujitsu is we, we sort of research market trends and the like to see uh, what the latest directions are. And although the standards making process can take some time. Again, we heard the previous speaker talk about standards coming out in a couple of years' time. A really interesting thing is to see, is to see what the standards bodies are just starting to work on. Because that gives a real good signal about industry maturity and industry acceptance. The point at which some new trends, some new technology, the point at which you start to see the standards bodies beginning to think about making a standard in some new, uh, some new field. That's a real good signal about industry maturity and industry acceptance. So secondly, publication and presentation platforms. Uh, it gives you, uh, a, as a business, a certain way to demonstrate capability to the marketplace, possibly influence the marketplace uh, through applying your intellectual property uh, into standards and then out into the marketplace. And finally, the networking opportunities. It uh, gives us a certain visibility and uh, a, a knowledge of customers and partners that we might not otherwise have opportunities to get. So again, just to clarify this, thinking about some examples. So in the first case, access to the uh, latest industry standards, again, using TOGAF in your internal enterprise architecture frameworks and using uh, certification, perhaps, uh, to, to skill up your people to learn these tools and techniques. The publication and presentation platforms, well, hey, here's one example. Presentations to, live, to industry conferences and putting forward your own intellectual property uh, to become part of industry best practice. And uh, when it comes to networking, you can join the working groups, informal groups at, uh, at, at events like this, and that allows you to form these relationships and have those interactions with customers and partners that you might not otherwise get. These things have real value. Um, it's, it's no coincidence, I guess, that I think at every open group event I've ever been to, then somewhere on the agenda, there's gonna be a, a, a networking evening. So you know, these things are there for a purpose. 
So some practical steps to take when it's about uh, access to the internal standards and uh, access to the latest industry standards, then clearly you need to get your internal process owners engaged, those internal people who make those uh, internal tools, internal methods and standards, get them engaged with the standards bodies using the intellectual property. And you've got to promote them as well to your internal t technical communities. Um, it's not just through the internal standards that these things have value. Uh, but also all of those cases where you've got somebody out there working on some project and maybe they're thinking, gee, you know, what, what's, a, what, what's a good way to, do, to solve this particular problem? Or, oh, wow, I could really do with a template to represent some model or something like that. So you have to make sure that all of you people know of the material that's available through the standards bodies so that you can take advantage of these things. Publication presentation platforms, well, again, pretty obviously proposing your presentations to organizations and events like this, or proposing intellectual property into the standards making process. And then when it comes to networking opportunities, that's all about me meeting the stakeholders and making sure that the engagement of your company is clearly visible. So, those are some ways we get value. But I've worked for a number of uh, companies through my career, some, some very large, some very small. In the smallest one, my employee number was just five, so that tells you something about how big the company was. And one thing they've all had in common is that uh, if you wanted to get some people, get some resources allocated to do something, then you've got to put together some business case, go through some sort of investment appraisal, and you know, somewhere along the line in the process of doing that, there's going to be an Excel spreadsheet or something like that with some, some cost and some benefits in it, and you're going to have to prove some return on investment so that they can get your, uh, you can get your resources allocated and actually do some piece of work. So how to go about that? Well, here's some practical steps that I hope will help you when you're faced with that sort of problem yourself. So first of all, let's think about you know, what, what are some practical things that can be counted? Because when it comes down to that Excel spreadsheet, um, yes, you can talk about great things like flexibility of <coughs> workforce and so on, but how do you actually put that into the cells on the spreadsheet? So what, what can you practically do? So using intellectual property, you can, you, you can think of things like, OK, I can count how many internal methods, guidelines, templates, etc., are published. I can think about, I can try and count how many projects have used the internal standards. And I can think about and measure how many people have been trained in these approaches. When it comes to demonstrating business capability, you can, you can count, for example, hey, how many presentations did your people stand up and give? Or how many uh, IP submissions did you make into the standards making process? And then for networking, how many stakeholders did you go out there and meet? How many opportunities? How many suspects might that have generated? And then next, how can we move on from there to actually calculating some sort of value? Well, the one I'm going to focus on is the one which, in my experience, actually produces the most countable, the most mm, evaluatable uh, benefits how many projects have used some internal standard or method. And you can get to that with some fairly sort of simple calculation, which I'll run through. You can look at something like downloads times a use rate times a saving per application. So I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, within your company, that the place you put your, uh, your internal standards, some sort of web-based repository, perhaps SharePoint, something like that. Um, I'm going to assume that you can get some counts out of that that tell you how many people have hit the page, how many people have downloaded that. Use rate. That's how you then take allow for the fact that just because somebody's downloaded it doesn't necessarily mean they've used it in some pr for some practical purpose. So you need to look at some proportion of so how many times from the download did that actually get put into some sort of productive use. And then finally, savings per use. OK, great, it's been downloaded, it's been used. What, what did that do for us as a business? And the 
simplest way to think about that is usually some sort of time save type of thing that because you use the standard approach, the standard guideline, you downloaded this template, whatever it is, that saved you X amount of time. You can put some staff uh, time value around that and come up with some saved value. And you can determine these things, uh, the last two things, by uh, surveys, for example, just sample surveys, just simply asking people, OK, uh, I can see you downloaded this. Did you use it? Yes, no. So you can get some proportions out of that. And again, you can survey people to say, great, I can see you use that template or that guidance, whatever it was. How much time did that save you? A couple of days, a couple of hours, a couple of weeks maybe, whatever it is. But you can get some credible values for these things. So this is an example I've taken straight actually out of a piece of work for Fujitsu. So these are uh, some absolutely genuine numbers. Uh, I've changed them slightly to protect the innocent, but basically this is lifted straight out of some internal work. So uh, top left there, um, there's some um, uh, stats from one of the internal, st uh, internal standards publication sites that gives us a way to judge a number of, uh, number of users, a number of downloads. So that gives us a number for that. Um, we surveyed the user base, got an approximation of the use rate, 50% in this model. Savings per use, seven and a half hours, basically a working day. Actually, I think that was a fairly conservative number, but when you're trying to roll this up into a business case justification, it's all better if it's a fairly conservative set of assumptions. Then put some staff rates around that. Because Fujitsu is a Japanese company, you can see there's some figures there in Japanese yen, but translate that into uh, British pounds because that's where, uh, that's where I'm based and that's where my budget comes from. And so then that gives you a benefit side of the equation. On the cost side, well, this is just an example of a, a cost model. Uh, I'm sure you can build up similar things, but there's just some staff time in there for the people developing standards. Uh, some time to actually generate the collateral, uh, to consult with some subject matter experts, and then to go out to do all the promotion and internal training type of things. So then that gives you a cost for uh, what does it take to actually develop this standard and get it pushed out into the field for use. And the great news at the end of all of this, there's a cost, there's a benefit. Whoopee, we've got a positive return on investment. So good business case. So my point here is that with some fairly simple modeling and some fairly straightforward and defensible assumptions, you can show a very good return on investment. And it's not just me saying this. Um, if you look out in the industry, there are um, from some organizations, some interesting bits of industry research that show some figures for how standards uh, improve business performance. So there's an ISO study, um, the, the, the full reference is given on the slides, that shows profit contribution from standards ranging from 0.15% to 5% uh, of, of profit contribution. And a study from the BSI, British Standards Institute, that shows an increase in turnover from using standards of between 1.7% and 5.3%. And I can tell you from the model that I presented on the previous slide, if you then uh, roll those overall costs as a proportion of the overall enterprise and how many projects and do a little bit more modeling, actually you come out with some numbers in a similar order of magnitude. So that gives good confidence that, you know, th this is for real. These are real benefits, real quantifiable benefits we get from using standards. So I've talked all the way through about three ways that a business gets uh, value out of standards. Now, I couldn't resist standing up here talking about, stand talking about standards and business value without mentioning a fourth way. Now, have we got any real network geeks in the room? IETF RFC 2549. Anybody know that one? OK, here's another clue. IP over avian carriers with quality of service, and the date might give even another clue, 1st of April, 1999. This is utterly fantastic piece of standards work. This is a standard, this is absolutely for real, you can go look it up. 
It's actually a standard for how you, uh, how you transmit internet traffic over carrier pigeons. Beautiful little picture taken straight out of the standards document of a carrier pigeon with a little payload, memory card or something like that tied around its foot. And even better than that, bless them, the Bergen Linux user group has actually implemented this. There's a little bit of console output there. Uh, shows how they pinged, uh, how many was it? Uh, nine packets of data. That's nine carrier pigeons. And uh, unfortunately, there's a packet loss rate there of 55%. Don't worry, nothing bad happened to the pigeons. It's just they didn't like make it to the far end in the time allowed. Round trip time of about, uh, of about half an hour there. But hey, th th this actually works. So here's another way to get value. Actually, it's pretty rare, but standards can have a sense of humor. God bless them at the IETF. So in summary, standards are a good thing. They give us flexibility of workforce. They give us interoperability. They give us process optimization. We can get to the value by using them, obviously, in our products and our services and in our skills development, certification, and things like that. We can also, through the standards bodies, demonstrate capability of the market and through uh, contributing IP possibly influence that marketplace. And networking and events like this, again, that has real value, shouldn't be ignored. That value and return on investment can be estimated to show a positive business case. And finally, yeah, standards can be fun. Thank you very much. We're always fun at the open group. Standards sure. bodies can be fun too. Absolutely. But no, thank you. That's that's great. It's great to see somebody put some numbers on on this, and and uh, thank you for sharing what you could of the the internal work that goes on. Because yeah, it's, no uh, problem. We obviously believe there's uh, ROI on this stuff, but uh, it's nice to uh, see hey, that some of our members don't do. Lie. Well, there we are. So, um, first question that came in. Um, it says, do you find value in working with and networking with your competitors? Um, I guess another way of putting it, how would you describe the value of that? So do we find value? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Because one of the uh, important things about standards, it's not just that it's a standard approach, but through all of that collective knowledge that we contribute and the governance processes that organizations like the Open Group and others uh, put around that standards making process. It means that what comes out of it is not just a standard, but it's a best practice as well. And we wouldn't get to that unless everybody was involved, you know, your competitors, your partners, your customers. So yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and we hear from, from customers, particularly large customer organizations, that one of the benefits of coming to a place like this, not just here, but uh, a place like an open group event, is the, the kind of neutral non-sales environment that they can, uh, can participate in from a customer perspective. Yep. So s second question, how does an organization like Fujitsu go about deciding who participates in a standards body? Who parts? Oh, so who internally? I think that really just comes down to uh, skills and knowledge because uh, the different standards bodies will have uh, different subject areas that they look at. And uh, if it's a question of you know, who gets involved in a particular, uh, particular working group or in some particular standards activity, I would say it's just simply down to skills and knowledge because uh, if you want people involved Let's take TOGAF as an easy example to talk about here. You know, if you want people involved in TOGAF development, then clearly you're going to want to put your experienced enterprise architects into that. So uh, I would say it is just mostly down to appropriate skills and knowledge. Right. And something I've always personally been interested in is, is I've heard organizations talk about using participation in international standards groups as a way of personal development or professional development um, for employees. Is that something you see? In yeah, yeah, very much so, because it is something that's uh, different to the normal day-to-day -day work. And for a lot of people, uh, that can be a very 
a very beneficial effect, um, you know, getting exposure to the, the world outside the company and uh, just broadening your experience base a little bit. Yes, uh, that's absolutely a good developmental thing. Okay, a question that's somewhat related to the, uh, the first one about, about the competitors. Um, it says, is there a cutoff between protecting internal IP? I guess I, I would say balance, but it's not my question. It, uh, is there a cutoff between protecting internal IP for advantage and sharing IP with the standards group? Uh, inevitably, yes, there is. And uh, you know, it, it's something that um, you know, I've had some personal experience of inside Fujitsu. Of course, yes, you've got to consider if you have something you consider a very uh, unique piece of intellectual property, you know, be it some technique or wh whatever it may be. Um, then you have to make a judgment about, is it best? Do we think it's going to give us the best advantage to, uh, to keep that internal? Um, or is it best for our business to actually contribute that out to the marketplace, hopefully get some recognition as part of that process, um, and possibly influence the marketplace with this uh, technique or tool or whatever it might be that you've, that you've contributed? I don't think there's any easy way to, to make that judgment, but uh, yes, absolutely, that, that judgment has to be made and very much a case-by-case -case determination. Yeah, yeah and it, it, it's interesting um, that the people, it, it's a kind of a mindset um, shift that needs to go on to participate in the standards world. And that, you know, the people, some of the people that find that hardest are uh, my former colleagues, I would call them uh, uh, intellectual property lawyers. It's all about protect, protect, don't give anything away, and it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's a completely different approach to standards to see the benefit of contributing something, maybe not the crown jewels, but contributing something for yeah. the yeah. benefit of it, of it becoming a, a, a standard. So it's a, it's a balance that I, I've seen companies have to you know, walk that line fairly yes. carefully. Yeah. Um, so one, one last question, um, Chris, before we, before we move to the next one. Um, how do you go about sharing the learnings, or how do the individuals go about sharing the learnings that they get from participating with the rest of the organization? Okay, well, um, uh, no great secret of rocket science. It is, very much a, it is very much a process of internal presentation, sharing reports, internal communications, bulletin boards, all of these types of things. So you know, for me personally, after this conference, um, yes, I'll be, I'll be writing up some key findings um, and presenting them at a number of internal events. And I'm sure you know, all, all of your companies must have similar types of things that go on, uh, internal events where you can share the, the, the learnings from, um, from standards bodies and from standards events. I'm sure you must have those things. But it is something you have to positively pan, uh, plan and do. It just doesn't happen by itself. And so it is one of the things you need to do to be able to get the value out of the standards, to think about how you are going to propagate these things internally. Because yeah. as soon as you get back, the day job kicks in, and it's yeah. easy, easy for it to get It's easy to lost. forget. So yeah. you, you've got to actively plan that in. Chris, this was great. Thank you very much. Pleasure.